Hello and welcome to Anambra State Governorship Debate 2021. I'm Ruben Abati. Hello everyone, so glad to have you join us. I am Gozi Alebu coming to you live from Oka, the Anambra State Capital. Welcome back. You're watching the live coverage of Anambra State Governorship Debate put together by Arise News in conjunction with Enough is Enough, E-I-E. Yes, indeed. And uh, we are live in Oka with uh, three distinguished and distinctive governorship candidates who have resolved to take up the mantle of leadership in the southeastern state of Anambra State. As a prerequisite to certain rules of engagement in political public service, the three candidates were selected through various transparent and impartial platforms in accordance with their vision and mission, programs, and agenda for the Anambra people. It is barely five days to the governorship election in Anambra State, popularly called the light of the nation. As a familiar tradition in politics, a debate where candidates meet to state how they hope to achieve their various objectives for the people is necessary ahead of the November 6 election. The debate is indeed necessary to help further articulate to millions of our viewers their leadership capabilities and how they intend to govern the people based on their goals. And today's debate is viewed across the globe from various broadcast uh, medium, both conventional and online. It can be viewed on Anambra Broadcasting Service, that's ABS, and Ogene FM in both English and Igbo languages. And of course on www.arise.tv, which you can watch on channels 44 on Go TV. 416 on DSTV and 519 on Sky. And as a two hours a debate, it is divided into two segments. The first segment will deal with a security and economy, while the second segment will engage the candidates on health and educational matters. And to foster, and to foster an atmosphere of mutual friendliness, all candidates have agreed to abide by the rules set aside for this debate by keeping to the time allotted to them for expression and with no usage of abusive words. We will begin by bringing in each candidate in an alphabetical order of the acronyms of their party names. First is Senator Andy Uba, candidate of the All Progressives Congress, the APC. Senator Andy Uba. Yes, and uh, Senator Andy Uba takes uh, the podium. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce next, uh, who is Professor Chukuma Charles Soludo, the candidate of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, ABGA. And finally, Valentine Uzibo, the candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. And uh, gentlemen, shall we take the national anthem of Nigeria? Rise, please, as we take the national anthem. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Well, 
looks like we're set. Yes, uh, indeed. The Anambra governorship uh, debate 2021. The election would hold uh, on Saturday, November 6th, just about five days away, uh, in uh, over 5,000 polling units. Yes. With about 2.4 million registered voters, 18 candidates on the ballot, and the uh, Independent National Electoral Commission has assured us uh, that this will be hitch free and that uh, every effort has been taken to ensure that the process is credible, fair, and peaceful. And on its part, the uh, Nigerian uh, police, speaking through the Inspector General of Police, Usman Baba Alkali, has also assured Nigerians and Idi Anambra uh, that uh, there will be a very good uh, security on the ground. About 34,587 uh, policemen, uh, including five Deputy Inspectors General of Police, uh, 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 five uh, assistant inspectors general, general of, of police, police yes. also 95 senior uh, police officers and three helicopters uh, to be deployed uh, by the uh, police. Yes, indeed. And this really should give the Anambra electorate confidence to go out uh, to vote come November uh, 6. Well, all three gentlemen are ready now. They've taken their positions uh, ready to begin to get the questions that we'll be asking them. This will cut across security, uh, find out what they have in store for the uh, economy of Anambra State if they get the opportunity to become the next governor of the state. We'll also like to find out what they have for health and so many other sectors that would be of interest definitely to the people of Anambra State. Ruben? Well, time allotted for answers to questions. Uh, is three minutes. Time allotted for follow-up questions and answer is just two minutes. And then rebuttals, just one minute. Uh, but now we'll take uh, opening remarks uh, by the uh, candidates and it's uh, four minutes uh, each uh, for, for, for each candidate. And we'll go first in an alphabetical order. So very quickly, without much ado, we'd like to start with you, uh, Senator Andy Uba, candidate of the uh, All Progressives Congress, APC. Your opening remarks. Thank you, Ruben and Chiwe. Uh, please, Ruben, I will seize your indulgence. Let us have one minute silence for the death of Chike Akunyele and Dr. Chike Akunyele and every other one that were killed in this state for the past, for insecurity. Can we have a minute silence, please? All right, okay. me, uh, then uh, are you okay with your Professor with your Soludo, remarks? Is this all right no, by no, you? No, I'm not. I just Mr. Asked for, Zibo, yes, do you I, agree? I asked, I asked for a minute silence for... Oh, you, you asked for a minute silence for um, Dr. Chike... Chike and the other people Akwe, that were killed. And those that were killed, killed recently. In, recently. Okay. Just a minute silence, please. Professor Soludo, is that fine by you? Yes, okay. Mr. Zibo, do you agree? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's stand for a minute silence. May their soul rest in perfect peace. Amen. Thank you. So now, Senator Andy, about two business, you may go ahead with your yeah. opening remarks. Thank you. You have right. just about Three minutes. Thank you, Arise TV, for creating this opportunity for me to be able to reach my people all over the world. My name is Senator Emmanuel Andy Uba. I am from Uga in Aguata local government. I'm running for the office of governor of Anambra State. I ran this office. I was in, I, I was in this, this same position in 2007 and won. I was sworn in as the governor of Anambra State. And I started performing my job when I was removed by the Supreme Court, when they said that Peter has not finished his tenure. And uh, after reflecting on what happened, I decided to go back to run for Senate. And I won Senate twice. I was in the Senate for eight years twice. And that's what has happened. Thank you. 
Right, thank you very much for that, uh, the candidate of the APC, Andy Uba. Um, let me bring in uh, Professor Charles uh, Chukuma Soludo, or the candidate of ABGA. Uh, you have uh, three minutes to make four. your... Four. Okay, four. <laughs> All right. Because I thought uh, Dr. Ruben actually gave you three minutes, but that's fine. I'll give you four minutes uh, for your opening remarks, but it has to be equal... Uh, time that we Thank give to all much. of you. And, Thank you very uh, much. May the souls of the policemen and the, all the people who have been killed, Akonyele uh, and all others, rest in peace. Um, let me start by saying my name is Charles Chukuma Saludo. And to put a context that uh, the world has changed, it's changing dramatically. The world is into the fourth industrial revolution. And um, Nigeria is going through a transition to a non oil economy. The challenges are huge nationally and for the subnationals. And that Anambra State, among the 36 states, must be looking for a transformational leader in these uncertain times. I want to suggest, dear friends, that given my knowledge, experience, networks, exceptional public service, and even exceptional private sector experience that I offer myself as that candidate for the people of Anambra at this material point in time. I am a passionate homeboy, village boy, from Isofia in Aguata local government, and um, a distinction grade in my secondary school, because I didn't forge my uh, secondary school certificate, with a first class honors, a BSc, economics, master's and PhD. I am one who has been, had abundant grace and blessings of the Almighty all my life. In my 30s, I accomplished virtually everything that was to accomplish professionally, and I would say in every ramification. Became a professor in my 30s, traveled all over the world, lived in Ethiopia, UK, Europe, and America, consulted for over 20 international financial and development institutions, and traveled to over 45 other countries around the continent of the world. And now came back to serve Nigeria. I have served three presidents in the public sector. And um, I dare to say I have been a founder and co-founder of some of the major corporations international that are of international standing, including the Transnational Corporation of Nigeria. And in public service, I've served three presidents of Nigeria. Uh, president of Basanjo, Yaradua, and now currently the current president. And a grateful nation has honored me with the third highest national honor in recognition of my distinguished public service. This is the time now for me, and the, of course in the world, I have been three-time winner of the best governor of Central Bank in the world. And therefore for me, based on my global experience, my national experience and knowledge, I believe it is now time for me to come home. And as chairman of Anambra Vision 2070, and we've just finished a draft, we're about to present that any minute from now once we get um, a go ahead. I think I have been able to think through the challenges of Anambra, think going through the entire space, almost all the villages and community of this uh, blessed homeland. It is now time for me to devote the rest of my life to giving back in full to the people of Anambra. We want a livable and prosperous homeland, especially for an itinerant people, a people scattered all over the world, but they now want a proud homeland. And I want to build, consolidate on the existing, what has been achieved by our forebears, to give Anambra a livable and prosperous, smart mega city that every Anambra person will be proud of. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Professor Soludo. Now it's your turn, Mr. Valentine Uzibo, candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. You have four minutes. Thank you very much. I am deeply, deeply grateful for the uh, privilege of uh, being um, the, given the opportunity to serve, um, to debate on, on, on uh, Anambra governorship um, aspiration. You know, for me, it is heartbreaking, heart-wrenching, thinking about my dear state uh, in the way it's being characterized. We've just observed 
uh, a minute's uh, silence for those who have uh, died. But what are we doing to stop our future? Uh, how do we take responsibility? Who is orchestrating this? Uh, who, uh, who, are, who are need leadership? At the state level, uh, we have APGA. At the national level, we have APC. To what extent have they done enough to cope this? It's not enough to observe a many silence. We need to do more. I am here uh, privileged to be part of this because, indeed, I believe what Anambra requires today is a young, vibrant CEO who has got experience, both global, national, and sub-regional, to be able to fix what is wrong with Anambra, who understands where the world is headed. We're moving to a digitalized world. We need people who are trendy, who are modern, who are classy. I can tell you, for, by God's grace, I am privileged to be the best among uh, who have seen here. Uh, who is Valentine Ozibo? I'm a child of grace who has done exceptionally well from school days up to university and up to uh, corporate life and philanthropy and also in the religious world. I am somebody who is passionate about whatever I do. Um, you require a transformation leader who has created jobs, who has worked in corporations, who has served proper true governance, who has brought to bear the experiences that we require, both in agriculture, in power, in oil and gas, in hospitality, in banking, have grown businesses in different parts of the world, in Africa and beyond. By the grace of God, what is required, I have. And what more I would need, I know how to get the right team, synergize, empower the team, and together we forge ahead to see how Anambra can catch up with the rest of the world. I'm passionate about solving our basic problems of road infrastructure, of insecurity, and doing the needful to ensure that Anambra people can be proud of the state once more. Right now, we're angry as Anambra people, and we should hold responsible those who have uh, taken us to this um, doldrum. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, the first question then, of course, uh, goes to uh, Dr. Ruben, you have the first uh, salvo. Uh, of course, I guess the debate begins in earnest, gentlemen. Doctor? Well, um, I'll come back to you, uh, Valentine Ozibo of the People's Democratic Party, and then we go uh, in, in the other direction. And it's about security. The fear of violence is the big concern uh, in this election. And uh, the police, the Committee on uh, Election Security, and other groups have said, well, enough efforts, enough arrangements have been made to ensure uh, that the uh, process goes each free. Um, are you satisfied with the uh, arrangements that have been made, the promises that have been made? The other two candidates will also have the opportunity to respond to the same question. But we'll start with you, Uzibu of PDP. Thank you very much. Indeed, about the preparation for this election, um, I am satisfied to the extent that enough uh, personnel has been deployed. But I'm not satisfied that we've allowed things to get this far before taking an action. A single soul is so crucial. There's nothing we do that's worth the loss of a life. And every day, we have occurrences. As of yesterday, we still have witnessed some. So, quite frankly, here I am urging my followers and number of people to come out in mass because that's the only way we can end bad leadership. The only way we can solve a problem is we come out to vote. Not to do nothing cannot be answered. We can't yield to the intimidation and fear. And we also must ask, where are these coming from? How come we don't have any intelligence anymore? How come we are not able to identify who is responsible for this? How come we're not bringing people to book? How come everybody's going to scoff free? I honestly feel that there's a lot we need to do both now in the preparation and going forward in solving an umbrella problem uh, security-wise. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have to let uh, you gentlemen know that you have three minutes to make your uh, interventions. So you don't want to, you know, shorten uh, your time. Let me come to Professor Charles uh, Saludo, the candidate of ABGA. Security, like uh, Dr. Ben noted, is the major concern, not just for the people of Anambra, but for the rest of the uh, country. Yes, and my question is, what exactly do you think is at the root of the sudden turn of events as far as security is concerned in Anambra State? Because, I mean, the, the light of the nation has always been known uh, to be, you know, to a large extent, a peaceful state. If you can diagnose exactly what the root cause is, 
can you tell us exactly what would be your, the low-hanging fruits if you become governor in tackling security against the wider you know, picture in the country? Thank you very much, and thank you for record for that acknowledgement that Anambra has, up until the last few months, remained about the surface state in Nigeria. And uh, the governor the has been decorated with awards and so on about being the surface state in Nigeria, and thank you very much. The insecurity in Anambra is a recent phenomenon, very recent. And I think um, uh, my brother on the other right, on the right-hand side, I'm sure when he responds, he might be able to tell a little more about uh, part of the reasons why that is happening. But Anambra has remained largely a safe haven. Businesses booming, real estate booming, uh, hospitality industries, and so on and so forth. And recently, it is a challenge, and the governor, as the chief security officer, has risen up to the challenge. And by the way, you know that all the security agencies happen to be within the purview of the federal government. But we've got an architecture, a security architecture, in which the federal forces have been working in tandem, in collaboration with the local. We passed the Anambra Vigilante Act, in which you also have the local collaborating with them. And in terms of how we go forward, I see three buckets. The first bucket is really the formal comb the local security architecture. The intelligence gathering, the uh, equipment, the military, the police, the DSS, and so on and so forth, and then uh, the local vigilante and what that has to happen. And they're all fully under. The next bucket is a dialogue and harmony, a dialogue and reaching some harmonious uh, agreement with the non-state actors, the non-state actors. Um, I mean, we'll elaborate when we probably come around to your second round of questions. And then, of course, the third bucket in dealing with it is what we have encapsulated in our manifesto. Prosperity, jobs, jobs, and opportunities for our youths. Um, that's I can take time since you have just two, three minutes to uh, talk on this. But I want to say that part of the recent upsurge in insecurity in Anambra is politically motivated. There are some people who think that they gain political advantage by creating a sense of fear and insecurity so that you have voter suppression. That is what we are gathering. When you, Valentine talked about um, intelligence gathering, that intelligence is everywhere. And I want to say that probably after the election, I'm satisfied that they are deploying about 34,000 policemen and with all the soldiers. And hopefully, once we. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. You already did more than three minutes. Oh, very quickly, we'll come to you, uh, candidate of the All Progress Congress, uh, Senator Andy Uba. Well, do you really agree? <laughs> you know. <laughs> that, uh, well, you know, there's nothing to fear about uh, safety or violence. But pa with particular regard to voter turnout and voter apathy, because some people have seen a study uh, indicating that voter apathy may also be a problem. And about 17% of the persons involved in that uh, survey uh, were citing the fact that some groups in the state are threatening that they may, they may not allow the election to go on, or that they will shut down uh, the state. Do you have any anxieties in that regard? No, voter apathy has always been the norm in Anambra State. In every election we've done, the turnout, the, low, the turnout has been very low. But let me tell you something. The governor, no, the, the importance of the, in every state, the governor is the security officer of the state. But let me tell you, in this case, the governor has not done what he's supposed to do. Now, Soludo said something pointed at me. I don't know why he said that, but he has to explain that too. Because if you look at what is happening now, it's, 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 of, it's, of, it's because the governor has refused to engage. When you engage, like in 2007, when I was going to run for governorship of Anambra State, I engaged the people that were involved, the massive group. I went to visit the Wazbika in prison, talked to him about it. When they said, shoot at sight, and there wouldn't be any election in Anambra State. I went and talked to the people. I said, look, because, because of job, I don't have to say, let's sit down and see how we can handle this. At the end, we got this ironed out. And there was an election, an election without violence. 
the governor refused to engage in that. You get, talk to them, bring them together, and see what their problems are. The problems are employment, employment, employment. There's no employment, and that's why the violence is getting what it is. So he's saying, I know, I don't know what he wants me to explain about the violence, because I'm not a violent person. My party is not a violent party. We're not being violent in any form. So I don't know where that is coming from. He has to explain that to the public, why he's made the statement he made. But let me tell you something. Once we finish this election, which I know definitely that APs, we are going to win, we see what will happen. We we'll take care of this problem that we have in security. They are not, look at the day that they called the security summit in Enugu. The government was, was campaigning with him, the day of the security summit. Why would you do that? You are supposed to go and discuss security in your state. You went, to, you went, to have, uh, you went to campaign instead of going to, going to discuss security issues in Enugu, where other governors were. He was accusing other governors of not, or not cooperating with him. How could you, you go there and accuse them rather than now saying that you didn't go there and campaign? Campaign is not the issue, the issue is security. Once you have security, we we'll have investment in the country, in, in the state. All right. Uh, I, I, I will give you. I will One give you the opportunity, uh, Prof, rebuttal. to yes. do your rebuttal. But we have to, uh, you know, take it to Valentine Ozibo so that he can uh, address the issue of how he will fix uh, security. In, uh, you know, if he becomes governor, what would be your approach, Mr. Valentine Ozibo, to? ensuring that their number feel safe and secure their businesses, their persons, if you become governor, against the bigger picture, you know, the prevailing situation in the country. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm not sure my mic is actually working well, is it? Okay. It's not. All right, please help uh, us ensure that the mics are, okay, okay, it's on. Okay. So, um, please project a little more. So okay, I'll, can... I'll do my best. Yes. So basically, the single most critical need for Anambra is providing safety, security in Anambra, because nothing else can function well. And please, let's shift away from you know, casting blames to accepting responsibility. The reality is that both Afghan and APC have failed Nigerians. This is general. Everybody. And I was shocked when my big brother, Soludo, was talking about how it was glowing economy in Anambra before election. Nothing has worked in recent times. But about security, there's a lot we can do. There's indeed a lot we can do. Just even go back to the, what, where Peter B left it. Providing money monthly to these vigilantes, paying them, providing vehicles, and making sure they're well empowered. There's no community that doesn't know they're criminal around them. Just get things well around there. That's number one. That's quick, you know, fix we can do. And then we'll move on from, from there to other things we can do on the economy side. We also are aware that when you have a thriving economy, when people are gainfully employed, when people are busy, they will, they will not, uh, you know, transcend into uh, criminality. So we need to also identify that part. And then if there are agitations, people are clamoring for positive change, especially creating trying to move away from the problem that the elder generation have created. Of course, if they are the ones that have created it, they can't be the ones to solve it. So we need to go back to the younger ones, and this is why, indeed, I do stand advantage. When we get, engage these people, they will listen to us more, because they feel I was part of NSAS, for instance, and because I hit, I know exactly where it pinches. And it's important that we deal with this and manage those agitations and solve sustainable. And then before we move on to creating better architecture, how can we move on to state policing where we can, I want to get to a point, I want to brag that Anambra police is better than, you know, any good police or something like that. So how do we begin to change these things over time? And this is why it's also important to look at the platform one is representing. Today, PDP has got the only chance of redeeming Nigeria from where it is. And this is why, this is not, not just about oh. another election, but in the, in, the, in the future elections to come. We need to tr change Nigeria for good. Thank, Thank you. you. Valentine Uzibo. Okay. So, I... Professor Soludo, yes. Thank you. Apart from uh, clarifying the point raised by uh, the candidate of the APC, what in specific terms will you also do if you were to become Chief Security Officer of Anambra State? Thank you very much, uh, Ruben. And... Um, um, that, so I have four minutes, one minute to rebuttal and on both of them. Let, let's put it on record. First of all, you say you engage. You only engage when you want to run for an election. And after an election, you go on voicemail. Never engaged. Never spoke to anybody. 
This is the one, and I will talk about it, who has engaged in and out of season. You were in Senate for eight years, not one word about the IPOB and the agitations in the Southeast. You were, you were only engaging where you want to run. Insecurity in Anambra started with the PDP government and uh, orchestrated by my brother on my right hand, kidnapping a sitting governor. It was a PDP legacy in Anambra. The PDP legacy in Anambra of burning down Anambra state. The violence, kidnapping, and so on and so forth on this state was started by PDP. When my brother on the right hand side was at the engine room stoking up all the fires. So we know that. That's fact, number one. Two, is it I'm surprised, Valentine, that you, were, you wouldn't have the basic numbers coming onto this debate. And you're saying, oh, things are fine, the economy. The... Let me tell you, for the records, Anambra State has the lowest unemployment of any state in Nigeria at 13%, National Bureau of Statistics not Anambra State numbers. Anambra State has poverty rate declined from 53% under P2B to 14.78 as at last year, National Bureau of Statistics, not our own numbers. Anambra State has the lowest underemployment rate at 17% of any state in Nigeria, National Bureau of Statistics. So when you want to say, and then, sir, Val, it is Governor Willie Obiano's government that passed the Anambra Vigilante Act. <coughs> no, wait, that's just been done with the governor, with the uh, traditional rulers okay. as the chief security officers. All right, you, you've okay. had your time, so, uh, Prof. Now, so, so what I'm trying to say is... Your, your, time, your time is up, uh, Prof. Sorry. Please, uh, uh, yes, uh, let me take it to the... Uh, candidate quickly, of the quickly, of the APC. Quickly, yes, yeah, you have the opportunity yes, to, uh, to, you know, to now, have that uh, rebuttal. But let me uh, hold on, please. Let me land on my point. Uh, the, the PDP candidates just said that the APC and ABGA political parties have let down Anambra State as far as security is concerned. I know, uh, gentlemen, uh, Prof. I know you're passionate about economics and finance, but we'll get to that. What we want to deal with in this segment is security and how you will tackle the issue of security if you become governor. Please, I need you to bear that in okay. mind so that we don't you know, go all over the place. Thank you so much. And so, Andrew, I'd like you to uh, you know, respond to that. And what would be your approach? Uh, you, do you support the idea of using vigilantes, like the PDP uh, candidate has said, if I got him correctly? Do you agree with the dialogue, as the APGA candidate has opined? What would be your strategy in tackling insecurity in Anambra? Remember, remember I talked about dialogue, Richard, when I started about dialogue. dialogue. I, I believe in dialogue, and I believe in, in the uh, vigilante group. Number two, we set up a response team. Let me, can I answer what he said about about Two minutes. Okay, about kidnapping and uh, whatever he said. I wasn't involved. I don't know what he's talking about, kidnapping. I had no business Come in on. that kidnapping. Come on. Now, there's a white paper that Come came out on, on the kidnapping. There's a white paper on the kidnapping. <laughs> Why didn't they put my name in the kidnapping? I have anything to do with it. What are you talking about? Let me tell you, I served, I was a special assistant to the president of Nigeria in this country that knows about security. That's yeah, about security. Talking I talking to a number wait, of people. I know, about, I know about security. I know about security. Now, let me tell you, he's talking about about saying that I'm involved. I'm mean, not involved in anything that concerns kidnapping or anything. It's not my, I wasn't even in the country when it happened. I was outside the country. When the call came through to me, 245 in the morning, I picked the phone, said they want to, but they just said he wants to speak to the president. I said, what happened? He told me what happened. I took the phone to the president. I woke the president and took the phone. The president asked me to call the IG of police and call Article, which I did. And the whole thing was, that was that's why, Voting was, was stopped. So how could I have been involved? If I was involved, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have made that, that phone call. Okay, so, okay. Thank now... Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, you still have some 30 seconds. Okay. I said I'll, I'll, I'll set up a response team in the state, whereby when something happens, there'll be a number that will dial, that will come to the rescue, and people immediately, there's an incident. I sponsored the bill in the Senate of... The bill I sponsored was... Um, there was a prison, prison reform bill, which I spoke on the Senate, that, that 
that was signed by the president into law. That's why it's a prison correctional institution in the Senate. You're saying I've been eight years in the Senate not doing anything. What did you do? I, I made sure you are the central bank governor. What, what have you done so far? You haven't done anything. You haven't done anything about it. You came from, they brought you to me, and I made Who sure. You? My brother brought you. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, audience, please, can, we need... How can you say what you know? Sorry, we and need then, to point out at this uh, here right now, no clapping, no jeering, no cheering, please. Please, absolute silence in the hall so that we can appreciate what the candidates are saying. Thank you very much. I will let show you here with Dr. Nano. I never forged your certificate. I never forged your certificate. Hello, gentlemen. Do you have secondary school? Of course. Hello, gentlemen. When? Come on. When did you graduate? Go, 1974. Go 1974? Yes. Go that you have go senior and, school certificate? Go and check. In 1974? Why? Before. Go and check it. I have a... 1974? Go and check. You yes. have senior Absolute school go. certificate go and check. in any new state? Look. It's forgery. Go and check it. The school is there. No, the, you are... You are, you are I don't, I, I don't I know what you have. It's not mine. I don't know what you have. Professor Soludo. I don't know what you have. It's not mine. So let me tell you something. Professor Soludo. You are overstepping your Please stay behind your podium. Yes, please. Thank you. Please stay behind your podium. Well, very quickly, please. Okay, thank you. We want to keep this very civil. Yes. Thank you. No abusive words, no noise from the auditorium. And then, of course, I hope the uh, candidates know that we have a technical team that is fact-checking what everyone is saying. If you make any claim, please be sure that it is correct, because mm -hmm. we are fact-checkers. Uh, candidates, ca candidate of the PDP, gentlemen, please allow the candidate of the PDP. He has uh, something to say yes, very, uh, quickly, you. very briefly. Two minutes. Yes, um, I I'm glad a number of people are saying these were the PDP of the past, both of them. He was actually the candidate of the party, uh, Sam, and these are the, the dysfunctional parts we're moving away from. We have a better, a better PDP today. When my brother Saludo was talking, again, going back to those theoretical statistics, when a number of people can see what is happening, we have the best unemployment. Show me where the, the, the people that are getting employed. Look at, look at it. I hope you're paying attention. Look at the road networks. Why don't he say that we have the worst road network in, in Nigeria today? What doesn't he say? What doesn't he say that we have the worst competitiveness index? I mean, 30, 23, 30 in different categories out of 35 in, in Nigeria. There's several things wrong with Anambra. And if you think it's still not broken, then you're not fit to be here. We know Anambra is broken, and I'm here to fix it. This is the reason I'm on this podium. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. It is understandable that we would spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, insecurity. Uh, one more, let's just do one more. On the issue of IPOB, IPOB, the prescribed IPOB, and you have, you have the militant arm of IPOB, the ESN, what will you do with IPOB if you become governor? Uh, Charles Oludo, you have one minute for that. And I'll ask the same question to all uh, the rest of you gentlemen. One minute, please. Is it me? Yes, please. Oh, thank you very much. Um, later, we'll come back to the other bit. But on IPOB, I am on record. 2016, 2017, I am on record speaking. I visited uh, Nam Dekano. I didn't know him. I never heard of him. Never heard of IPOB. But when I heard, he was in Kuje prison and uh, court order to release him, court judgment to release him, and they refused. I am the one that led 12 further prominent Igbos to go to Kuje and dialogued with him. And I addressed the international press conference to ask for his release. Thereafter, people started visiting Kuje, and three, four weeks later, he was released. I believe that an idea, I may not agree with him, with his views on terms of the destination, or even the means, but I believe that in a democracy, you put everything on the table. The Southeast leaders, religious, the bishops, the, um, the uh, traditional rulers, the youths, all the groups, are now working on a consensus that we need to dialogue on this to have a solution. Thank you very much. Well, please go ahead, uh, Valentine Ozigo of the PDP. Same question. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I honestly, one minute I honestly feel that indeed what is happening is a failure of leadership. 
Agitation happens when leaders fail their people. And so when there's a vacuum, uh, Nandi kind of came on board to fill that vacuum. Obviously, clearly, there are the areas agitation may lead to that may not be exactly how we want it. But the truth is, those agitations, are they founded? In most cases, yes, because marginalization happens in, in Nigeria. And Anambra or Igbo people are part of the victims. And it's happening all over uh, Nigeria. So I urge for dialogue. I urge for him to be released. And I urge for IPOB to be this, the prescribed. So that we can all sit together and solve problems in and take an, an Nigeria to another, another level, and Anambra in particular, to where we want it to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the same question to you, uh, Andy, about the candidate of the APC. What will you do with IPOP, ESN, and other non-state um, actors? I believe, in engage, I believe in engagement, like I said before, like did in myself. I believe in, if you don't engage them, how would you know what their problem is? So I believe in that engagement where we sit down and dialogue because it's, all their problem is work, employment. They don't have employment. So I believe in that engagement. So that's what we do to sit down with them and engage them and find out what the problem is. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're trying to manage time, Professor Soludo. There will be, you have a, you have a chance when you are giving your closing remarks. Uh, you know, just note some of the points uh, that you want to see comment on. But we want to talk about the economy. And let's talk about the infrastructural challenge in Anambra Street State, particularly roads. If you were to become governor, what will you do about the state of the roads in Anambra State? And also bear in mind the concern of many Anambrians uh, who complain that whenever anybody becomes governor and they want to fix roots, they start in their own part of the state, creating concerns about equity, fairness, and justice in terms of the distribution of uh, infrastructure in the state. Will you be fair when and if you become governor? I'll start with you, Professor Soludo. Oh. Again, it's three minutes. No, thank you very much, and um, I welcome this. He says something about the road. Clearly, the OBNOS government, P2B, by the way, implemented the APGA manifesto and did well, because he referenced P2B. P2B relatively did well. He did the roles as an APGA governor, implementing APGA manifesto. The, uh, OBNOS has taken it to the next level. Not only did about 17 bridges, did some roads and built us an international airport. There is the road challenge that needs to be fixed. I'm, I'm, I admit that. I'm, I've gone around through almost all the villages in Anambra, from Olumbanasa to Werizukala to um, uh, I mean, uh, Obaru, and all the communities go to Oka North and so on. Anambra, there is a road challenge. And when I become governor, now continuing from where Obiano stopped, we are going to declare a state of emergency on roads. So that's no question. That's uh, taking off for that. And my manifesto has elaborated on this. But how we get that to do, part of what we got to fix, because several of these, they just say we'll do roads and do that and so on and so forth. You got to deal with numbers. When you quote numbers, somebody says theoretical. That's very uh, embarrassing, I mean, quite frankly. I quoted National Bureau of Statistics. You got to know how many roads are in dysfunction for you to fix it. If you can't measure it, you can change it. And therefore, we have an agenda of tier one, tier two, tier three, and even alternative models, the ones that will be concessioned out, you know, within this umbrella of a state of emergency on roads, the ones that we're going to concession out on the PPP thing, the one that would do directly with government uh, financing, and there are places that you have uh, traffic jams that we need to lower. In fact, I had said that, I mean, the urban renewal agenda, if I am sworn in tomorrow as governor, I will start the urban renewal from Oboko. That is the places that haven't got one square foot of third road, in spite of all the years of Ngige, Mbadinuju, P2B, up till now, that we have to give priority. So. I have got it thought through, but more fundamentally, what is different between us is that I have thought through how this will be funded, which is my forte. How and where are we going to get the money to do this? Because even if you devote the entire state budget to fixing roads alone, all the roads that have been flagged off, 
in one, two years, you wouldn't finish them, the entire budget. And so there is a question about financing, alternative mix, and we have laid this out in my manifesto. All right. The You've done your time. Thank you very much. Let me take it to the candidate of the PDP, Valentine Ozibo. Well, some figures say that Anambra State needs somewhere between 5 to $10 billion to fix the infrastructure gap. Uh, I mean, that's a humongous amount. And uh, a prof, as Ludo has just said, the issue is funding. If you become governor, how will you fund the infrastructure gap? And it's not just roads. Housing is there and other infrastructure uh, that's needed. Thank you very much. You know, when I uh, made the uh, mention of uh, my uh, big brother, Saludo, being a tourist, I wasn't uh, missing words. Um, I wish um, it could point to uh, expertise in execution. Uh, today, I, three of us are from uh, the same local government, Agwata. Iname is where I'm from, my roads, and Iname is better than Sofia roads, better than Oga roads. And these are people who have held high positions that I'm shocked that indeed they're actually even featuring on this debate, quite frankly. And also, I must say, um, when it comes to infrastructure, there are basic things we need to do. When you say you've planned it out, how the funding, I, I'm not planning it out. I, I, I already started announcing what I'm going to do with the roads. For instance, beyond deploying state resources, saving money from wastages that we see in this other government, saving money and channeling it to where it's needed, I've also said how I'm going to leverage the power of private sector. In, Nigeria, in Anambra State, the biggest asset we have is our people. How do we leverage our people and their resources and their intellect and ingenuity? And what I've done is to say, I'll create a competitive environment where people are able to support what government is doing, and we encourage them, we recognize them. So if you build a um, 10-kilometer road in your location, which a number of people are known for, we're actually going to complement. And with that, you can have a bragging right about what government, what you're attracting to your community. And when we do that, we're going to have leftover of places we can now in intervene with government resources. The point here is government money alone can't fix our roads. So we need to bring ingenuity uh, beyond just what we can do with uh, state resources, how we can leverage the power of private sector and also leverage the power of multilaterals. There's no other option uh, available. So these are the options. Uh, you're not going to borrow expensive bank loans to, to, uh, to fix. Uh, is, is it that you're fixing with your savings from IGR and FAC? Or you're fixing, and by cutting waste, by the way, cutting waste is a major part of it. And then also channeling your energy of private sector, which our people are known for. We are intellectually sound, and we are wealthy as a people. How do we get those wells to work for us? And how do we now leverage the power of, you know, multilateral, especially in fixing many erosion sites that we see all over Anambra State? Anambra is totally shattered, not even broken. And quite frankly, we can't cling on to the dysfunctional past in solving the problem. Well, candidate of the uh, All Progressives Congress, uh, your take on infrastructure routes that we've been APC rather, uh, All Progressives Congress APC, the uh, routes that we've been talking about, but even beyond the routes, another major uh, piece of infrastructure that we now have in Anambra is the International Airport. That airport was commissioned. So if we were to become governor, uh, what more will you do to make sure that that particular uh, infrastructure that is now in place uh, is of a greater benefit of great use to the people of Anambra. But start with the roads, and, and then maybe you add the airports yeah, to it. Now, for the roads, I will declare a state of emergency for the roads. It's, it's, it's deplorable what the roads are. And he is saying that he's been, you've been advising them for the past 16 years. You couldn't advise them on the roads. You are saying all this, speaking all this long English here. You couldn't advise them on what the roads are all about, on how they could take care of the roads. You were the Senate. Well, yes, I know what I did. I know what I did. And the, I know what the I, federal I, road I know, in your constituency is a federal road. Look at the federal totally, road. Look at the, you go with helicopters. Professor Soludo, you, you have your. You, you will get speaking, a chance. Not speaking, to do not, a not speaking long English. You know, you, you, if you're the advisor, you should have advised him in the way how they can handle this. Please situation. direct direct your. Yes. You should have advised them on how to. Well, we said the state of emergency on the roads. We we'll make sure that all the roads are being looked at very well. Secondly, the airport you mentioned. To at the airport, yeah, we we'll make I'll make sure that I get the airport everything they need in order to, to, to operate because it will be a it will be a very busy airport, one of the best airports they have, that I acknowledge. But we have to 
do so many things to make it work well. Right now, it's not working, and I'm sure, as a governor, I'll do that. And uh, when you're speaking about where would we get the money to do it, was, yeah, we look at instances, like plugging up the IGR. Now, if you look at, the governor is build, they're building a 10 billion uh, conference center. Why couldn't they put it on the roads? 10 billion, that's what it costs. Now, if you go out there and look at it, there are about over 1,000 buses, branded. What are they doing with that? Branded with Soludos, which are over, just right here, one, over 1,000 buses branded, and people are suffering in the state. There's no road. What are you people doing with it? Okay. All right, let me bring it to Professor Charles Soludo. Will that be fair? I believe uh, <laughs> Valentine Ozibu has already made his intervention. Okay, on the issue of uh, not just infrastructure, the economy as a whole of Anambra State, uh, with figures that we have, uh, GDP per capita of $1,615, uh, the IGR as at 2020 of Anambra State uh, stands at about 28 billion naira. If you were to compare with states like Lagos that have, you know, boast of about over 400 uh, billion uh, Nara, you would say that is almost nothing. How will you shore up the IGR of Anambra State without resorting to going cap in hand to the center that has been the practice till now? Um, thank you very much. And um, I think uh, on this uh, platform, there is only one person with the experience who has done it before who has not only drafted plans, I drafted the National Economic Empowerment and Development Strategy of the Obasanjo regime, and that created about 12.8 million jobs in this economy. And that was the, the, the golden era of Nigeria's economic transformation. Again, that is not, we don't deal with theoretical figures. Figures, facts are facts. I think the first thing you do when you want to govern a place, you even want to plan, is that you must have great respect for facts. Facts. You don't just throw up and say, ah, I can feel it. Facts. Quote your source, and then we can deal with that. And I have said, for me, coming in, um, IGR is an issue, and um, it's 28, but it's come from less than 10 billion when this government came in. And we still hope that there are several leakages that need to be plugged, we deploy technology, and so on to ramp up our IGR. Certainly comparing with Lagos is a no-brainer. Lagos is about 30, 35% of our national GDP. It's not comparable. The size of the economy of Anambra, we want to ramp it up our IGR to about somewhere around, if we can make 5%, just 5% of the economy of Anambra in terms of our IGR. And we believe that we have got the experience and the technology to do that. We have done so before. I have developed plans that worked. In the financial services, I developed plans and clinically executed. I was not named the best governor of central bank in the world for nothing. Execution was the major reason given by the Financial Times. And therefore, when I promise and I say, this is what we will do, I promised consolidation, they said impossible, we delivered. I promised to transform the bankrupt mint, they said impossible, we delivered. I promised to deliver, to set up a transcore. Uh, my friend Obo Tudeko and co said it was not desirable, but it's got done. And so on and so forth. My record in public service is that I do what I say I will do. And on this one, we're going to ramp up IGR. And of course, come up with some other creative financing, project finance, for example. It's one that I also hear, I think I'm the one with the experience who has had to raise over a billion dollars to set up a financial institution. And we're going to set up an Anambra Development Fund, and I have started there on my manifesto, $200 million for a, for, uh, for a start. And then we want to ramp it off over time to a billion dollars. I, I am the only one on the podium who has done it before. And for Anambra, it's a piece of cake for me. Well, let's come to you, candidate of the uh, People's Democratic Party. How will you improve upon the state's fiscal performance? One report says, well, the fiscal performance in the state appears to be a bit decent. Mm. But 
there's still a lot, of more, a lot more to be done. Yes. And then you have the challenge of poverty in the state, about 14.48%. And then you have an employment rate of 44%. If you had under unemployment to that, you have about 60.70%. What we, well, I'm quoting a particular source, Professor Sorry. NBS. <laughs> National Bureau of Statistics you, no, is 13% and 17%, please. Well, Thank you, Reverend. Don't worry, uh, no, what's the source? Well, Professor Soludo, Can you quote as it? I told you earlier on, I feel the poverty. there are fact checkers. I feel the poverty. There are I fact the poverty. I've gone on a number of things. You know, uh, in the backstage, and we are checking all of these facts. And you can be sure, you know, you know we will uh, uh, put all those facts out there. Now, Valentine Ozigo, People's Democratic Party. Um, you know, I, I thank you for those uh, comments. You know, when, again, Prof was talking about being a number-driven person, maybe he's also forgetting who I am. I'm a chartered accountant. I'm a fellow of the Institute. I've uh, also worked in the financial world for decades. And so, quite frankly, I know data when I see one. But we need to relate this to the people at the grassroots. I'm talking about having gone the entire 21 local government seven times and more and feeling what people are feeling, that when we begin to relate the reality, I can tell you for, far, for free that indeed Anambra deserves far more. And in terms of awards, it's talked about awards received as central bank governor. I was in banking those days. I really, really don't want to delve into things we shouldn't be talking about today. But I can tell you what we suffered was failure of regulation when it was central bank governor. The number of jobs that we lost is unprecedented after he left. And you know why? Anyway, let's leave that for another day. And he's also spoken about Transcorp. He's said it a number of times. Quite frankly, Transcorp was founded, sold shares for 7 now, 50 kobo, crashed to 50 kobo. We came on board to rescue Transcorp after he has left in government. And again, precisely, he has no role in hiring Valentine. Because going around different places saying he hired Valentine. I wish uh, Nicholas Okoye and Ndio Kerekonyi one video to have rebutted the fallacy that has come out from, from my dear brother and friend. Talking about how to deal with the fiscal infrastructure um, system we have in Nanamba. It's really about growing the pie and cutting waste. I'm a global Kaizen champion. I know what continuous improvement is. When you get in there, you cut waste. There's so much waste around. We spend money on frivolities. We forget, you know, we, this government inherited 75 billion in cash, in cash, raw cash. Today we are 130 billion in debt. We generate about 28 billion in, in, in uh, IGR, and about 50, about 78, up to 80 billion. For eight years, we do the numbers. What have we done with it? If we do well, we can raise easily in eight years a trillion naira. What can we say we have done with this um, economy? Quite frankly, there's a lot more to be desired. And I keep saying this please, India Nambra, can we move away from the past and cling on to reality? Thank you. All right, very quickly to the candidates of the APC. Let's talk about the debt profile of uh, Anambra. Domestic of the APC, yes. Uh, domestic profile, uh, 59.98 billion naira. That's the debt profile uh, from the domestic end. The foreign end, $108 million. How would you address the issue of debt? And another point that I'd like, maybe hopefully we have time for all three gentlemen to address this. Anambra State has about 10 trillion cubic feet of gas. That's a lot that can actually earn revenue uh, for the state. Is that an area that you plan to look at? Have you thought about it? And if so, what are your plans for gas in Anambra State? Yeah, yeah that's a plan I'm looking at. We looked at that plan in my manifesto is there. Let me tell you something. In the, this job is not, a, is not for managing, it's a, it's not, it's a leadership position, not management position. For management position, we can get him. For leadership, he doesn't know what he's saying. He's not a leader. You know, let me tell you, yeah, he, he's not. Why are you laughing? I'm serious. Yeah, it's, it's not, this, is not, this is not banks. Yeah, in management, yes, but for leadership, you cannot. I know my people, my people know me. So let me tell you something. I know you are a massage, a massage expert. As a, as a, that's what I know you yeah, as well. Gentlemen, you are addressing Please. the Please. audience, the viewers at home. When, when you left Please. Central Bank, Central Bank, when you left that place, the economy collapsed. You know that. <laughs> Listen to what Okonjiwala said about him. I'm sure you know what Okonjiwala said about him. So that, that, 
is out there, people will know what you're going to say about it. The Nigeria has to be plugged. What is happening in this stage is that Nigeria is being given to private family business. That's what they are doing. That's why we're not. Sorry, if I can come in very quickly. My question was how you will tackle the debt uh, profile by, by, of Anambra State and what you will do with gas by, that it has yeah. in quantum. Yeah, definitely for the gas, we are going to put on a system which we are working on to make sure, you know, gas that will run into help people in developing the, the power and things. We are setting up an industrial park. We will use that gas to develop that and make sure a lot of people are being employed and will make money from there. All right. Okay. Well, um, do I again start with you, candidate of the APC, and then we go this way before we come back this way. We just need clarification on one issue uh, that came up earlier on when the question was asked about IPOP. Do you condemn IPOP or do you support IPOP and For similar me? groups in Anambra State? Let's start with you, candidate of the All Progressives uh, Congress, Senator Andy Uba. You know, for me, talking about condemning or supporting IPOP, we need to see that in dialogue. We need to find out exactly what's the problem. People killing people are not what, that cannot get us anywhere. That cannot give us the independence or the freedom that we need. We need to sit down and engage and be sure what you are talking about, what, they, what their needs are. When you see that, me condemning IPOP or supporting IPOP, it's not what I'm, I'm going to say because you need to see what the problem is in the first place before you can tackle the problem. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not going to say I support IPOP or I condemn IPOP because I have to know killing is not right. It's not, it's not, it's not in any form and shape. Even if one soul is being killed because of that, it's not. And no, mind you that so many, so many things are happening now. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, let me bring that question to uh, Professor Charles Saludo, a candidate of, of, of uh, APGA. Do you condemn IPOP's activities, the ideology, and the way they're going about putting their message across. Do you agree with their method, or would you condemn them? Let me be clear. I am the only one on this podium who is very clear on IPOB agitation, the new Biafranism and new Zikism. I happen to be the immediate past chairman of the Ohanes and Ibo. Uh, planning and strategy committee, and that a QMA square will reel out the position of the Igbos on restructuring Nigeria. That obviously says, in terms of the mainstream about independent Biafra, I am a pan Africanist, a pan Nigerian, and that I have said and written copiously about for decades. However, I also am on record to have also said that the IPOB deserves there to be heard that this thing where the idea that the agitation cannot be shot down by a gun. When my brother says it, you have to find out. It's living in the moon. All these years, you don't know what IPOB is agitating for. You know what they're agitating for. You're either for or not against. That's not world leadership. So for me, well, we need to have a dialogue, bring everybody to the table, and discuss those specific issues that are the agitations. And then, you know, but I have an alternative view, and my alternative view is prosperity in Anambra and prosperity for the Southeast. Okay, uh, candidate of the PDP, Valentine Uzibu, um, same question. Where do you stand on the question of IPOP? Very clearly. Um, see, in life, I've seen good men do wrong things. I've seen wrong men do good things. So it's always good to get to the activities of any group or any person and support what is good and condemn what is wrong. So there are certain things IPOB does through agitation on things that happen that I support. But when they get to some extreme, then I condemn. It's, it's, it's that clear. So there's no equivocation and you know, speaking grammar about it. It's that simple. But the real issue here is, where is the heart of all of this? I can tell you, if not for the way the current government, at the level both state and, and, and federal, have handled uh, IPOB question, we wouldn't get to where we are today. Let's start by accepting responsibility. We created the extremism that things are getting to, and which is we need to now have the right person that inspires hope for that dialogue to happen. When they see you as the, the problem already, you can't be the one to mediate. 
That's why you need a Valentine, a useful person. I keep insisting to deal with issues of IPOB. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. If you are just uh, joining us, if you are watching us on Arise TV, or you are listening to us on Anambra Broadcasting Service on Ogene FM, this is the Anambra Gubernatorial Debate 2021, coming to you live from Oka. And we have uh, here with us the candidate of the APC, Senator Andy Uba, candidate of the APGA, uh, Professor Charles C. Soludo, and candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Valentine Ozibo. We go on a short break now. When we return, the debate will continue. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us as uh, we have this debate between three uh, candidates. Of course, the candidates of the APC, Andy Uba, the candidate of ABGA, Charles Chukuma Soludo, Professor. Uh, of course, the candidate of the PDP is none other than Valentine Ozibo. The three gentlemen have been responding to different questions in the course of this debate. They've touched on security, touched on what exactly they have in store for the people of Anambra as far as infrastructure is concerned. We'll still stay a bit on the issues around the economy before we move on to other uh, points. Uh, doctor? Well, very quickly, I was going to raise this question. And I think I should start with you, candidate of the APC. Anambra is uh, very famous for its large population of billionaires. But many of these billionaires, they are great investors in other parts of the country. They often just come home for holiday or to come and uh, take care of their country homes. Uh, what will you do if you were to become governor of Anambra State uh, to attract these investors, these uh, billionaires, uh, to Anambra State, some kind of incentive, particularly now that there is an international airport here. And why do you think many of these likely homegrown investors uh, stay away from Anambra? First of all, you have to make sure that the security station is calm. Make sure they are, secu they are secured when they come. Number two, you have to give them some tax incentives, whereby when they come, you give them some years of tax incentive that will make them to now bring their investment in Anambra State, into housing, into petroleum, oil and gas, into different sectors. You have to give them incentive that will make them come back. But there's no that such incentive in this government. I have to give them tax incentive that will allow them to invest their, their, their funds in the state. Because they will be investing in many places, in Lagos, Kano, and different places. They're not doing so here because they don't have, one, the security, one, they don't have the tax incentive that will help them to invest their money. Thank you. All right, let me take it to the candidate of APCA, Professor Charles Soludo. The same question. How will you attract foreign direct investment? And what will be your strategy uh, to encourage local investors? Like they say, charity does begin at home. Oh, thank you very much. Just um, one line. First of all, corporate taxes are within the federal exclusive list, not state. State doesn't have power to give tax concessions to companies. That's a given. Now, what we have in our manifesto, we have a full agenda to make Anambra the number one place for the ease of doing business. We've got stuff, items from industrial parks that will be gas powered. We have the enablers in terms of security. We have the ICT that we are going to have the last mile connection from the 850 kilometers of broadband fiber optic cable around the state, you know, for people to have access to uh, easy and cheap Wi-Fi access. Of course, once you fix security, human capital is very, very key. And then our industrial parks, where we're going to you deploy captive power and uh, in, in partnership, of course, with the EEDC, there is the eBay to gas, power, gas plant already at Omase, you know, ready to go. All this we're going to deploy to have for people, industrialists in the industrial clusters, to have access to cheap power, cheap power. Of course, fixing the road infrastructure is one. And then we have the big elephant in the room, and which is a big venture capital fund, where we are warehousing about 5 billion naira every year. 
to help with the startups. If you come to Anambra to do it, we are targeting about a thousand youth millionaires every year. If you can do it in Anambra, we'll give you that. We have from importing to manufacturing to exportation program where those who are importers, uh, importing, we structure deals between you and your foreign partners to come and manufacture it here in Anambra. And if you manufacture it in Anambra, I'm wearing a quilt, for example, the Made in Anambra First project and the Anambra standards is what we are going to promote my whole agenda to make Anambra an industrial technology leisure hub of West Africa. It's a huge thing. I can speak about it for the next uh, several hours, as it were. The, what we have to create an number as a digital tribe, because the investors to come need a workforce that is created into the digital space, as it were. They need the, 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 the workforce that have got the talent, the skills, and the effective labor wage as low as possible. There is a rising cost of manufacturers in India and China today, and they are looking for cheaper cost production areas. Our agenda is to make our number the number one in terms of ease of doing business. We're going to ratchet up that. The ease with which you register and transfer titles, for example, of land, property, we want to bring it down from whatever now to no more than 72 hours, and so on and so forth. And commercial costs to settle commercial disputes. These are what the investors well, need to come to Anambra. You. Thank you, Professor Soludo. Well, more or less the same question. You know, definitely the people of Anambra need both local and foreign investors. Uh, but let me turn that question around a little bit. Mm. If you talk about Anambra, people uh, refer to Unisha, famous Unisha, which is uh, the commercial nerve center of the state. People talk about uh, Newi, which is the technological hub in the state. Okay, they also talk about Oka, which is the capital. But if you were to become governor, what would you do? What strategies do you have in place to transform Onicha in a way and also take development in terms of investment to the hinterland where there's a lot, either in terms of tourism or other resources in the state? Uh, Dr. Ruben, is it that you've been reading my manifesto or you're in the spirit? Because uh, that's exactly the way we, we need to go. I am sorry to go back to my again, elder brother here, is part of this government in many ways. And yet, we are one of the worst places to do business. How come nothing has been achieved? And how do you, do you reward impunity? No. Please, but the question here is, how do we get our number of people to believe in our state, to be able to deploy their resources, to make those resources work for their number? And I have a few things to say quickly. Number one, Money goes to where money is comfortable. The whole concept of a corona of this administration is a failure. I've seen people who leave their businesses from Lagos and down to Anambra and they become broke because we have a terrain that is uncompetitive. We simply need to raise the level of competitiveness of Anambra. And this is why I evolved a five cluster approach to dealing with this issue. First cluster I keep emphasizing is on Asia. What should happen in Onisha for it to be more functional, um, more business friendly? And you don't solve these problems by just thinking from your home. You go to the pro people and find out from them what is your problem? Well, how can we help you to do better? And this is why we have to deal with the issue of discipline, the impiawazo, the thoughts everywhere we need to cope, the traffic situation, the, the road network, the other infrastructure. Leveraging the gas infrastructure, why can't we you know, create a new energy city where we can move from gas to power generation to petrochemicals and get our number working? How do we deal with the port issue? Moving on to Newe, that can be industrial hub. What do we need to do there? Finding a, you know, what I call a power solution, uh, using what I call leveraging the economies of scale. When you find a problem, a solution to a problem that costs across the various people and they share the cost. The concept of shared cost will bring the cost low. And with that, our number becomes more competitive. And when they start doing business, start succeeding. You don't need to preach to them to come home. They will simply go with the testimony of those who have succeeded and they'll start coming home on their own. You don't need to preach it. You just have to use what I call the push and pull factors in driving this. You go to Oka, that can be a true state capital. Look at Oka here. Can you believe this is our capital? It's a glorified village. What has this government done? Nothing. Look at the roads. 
How do we fix all these little things? Look at the educational and healthcare institutions, tourism institutions within this city. Move on to uh, Oman Balaxis, that can be a, and a hub for agricultural processing. Take agriculture from the input level to processing to marketing to export. Again, leveraging the uh, new airport there. Move on to older goals that can be a new technology hub. Where we can get it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, bring it to the candidate of the APC, uh, Anduba. There, there is a nexus between unemployment and poverty. The figures not too encouraging. Unemployment, 60%, a little above 60% in Anambra State. Poverty hovers around 14.78%. 14, 14 well, our fact checkers will fact check, uh, Professor Saludo. Now, and there's also, there's also the challenge of wastage in government, whether at the state level, local government level, at the federal, you know, at the center. What, do you have any strategy to plug the loopholes that make for wastage in government that can actually shore up revenue for the state? Yeah, like, like I said before, a lot of leakages. Please protect. I said, I'm sorry. Project. I said, like I said before, there's a lot of leakages. Let me tell you something happening. In the local government system, now, my local government, this I got government, gets 200 and something million every month. Do you know how much is given to them? Five million to pay their salaries, and that's it. Now, if we use that local government money to develop the local government, then we'll have activities going on. Every month, if you have that 220 million that is coming in, or whatever is coming in there, you put it in the road network. Every month you're putting, by the time you know it, the road is done. You have people employed, women that are supplying sand, food, and all those people that are supplying nothing. So that's in one way we must work out the local government. I will, in six months, make sure that I do a local government election. That, look at other places that, that have local government working. They have things going on in these states. They don't come to Oka to come and disturb. If you talk about Onitsha, we build a road network, a flyover in Onitsha to make sure they congest the traffic in Onitsha. We do so. Come to Newe, put in the gas well and help them do manufacturing in the Newe. You come to different places. The local government is very, very important because if you have a state that local government is working, then everything is working. Here it doesn't work. The money is, they are giving just stipend to pay the salary. The, the salary, every other thing was being pocketed. I don't know what they're doing with it. They could not use it to develop the state. So that's where we are. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, this time, let me start with you, candidate of the PDP. Now, environment. The environment is a major issue in uh, Anambra State, as is the case, I guess, uh, globally. Uh, issues of gully erosion and other challenges. If you were to become a, a governor, what would you do to mitigate the impact of climate change risks in uh, Anambra State? Uh, this is a topical subject at the moment. Uh, leaders of the world are meeting at uh, COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. Before then, there was a meeting of the G20 uh, in Rome, hosted by uh, the Italian government. What are your thoughts on the environment in Anambra State? It's honestly um, a worrisome situation. I, just yesterday, I was in a gully erosion site, one of six in just one small community called Achina, to see for myself the lamentation of the people. You see houses at the precipice falling in and roads cut. You want to go from one location to another within the same community. You have to go around about five other communities. And that's the magnitude of the problem that we face. I can tell you, again, what we are seeing is abandonment of governance. What we need to do are enough to curb the situation, elevate our future, and have a sustainable reality for those to come, our generations to come. How do we fix this? We deploy resources within the limit of the state, leverage the power of the private sector, and rely also on multilaterals. Do things that will make for multilaterals to believe in our openness and transparency. Because if you have a, 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 a governance um, and leadership that is opaque, that people don't know what you're doing, they will not trust you enough to deploy those multilateral resources to get these things done. Because some of these are going to be quite expensive. And there's some we can deal with simply by direct level, just by providing small employments and can cope this problem. And move beyond that from gold erosion size to things like, um, you know, 
uh, recycling. The number of things we can leverage to recycle and, and generate renewable energy uh, within Anambra State. I have um, one gentleman, Boske, who has supported his, my banking days, who has gone into this area, providing the solution to places like Lagos. We are putting together a master plan to ensure that we deploy this in Anambra once I get into power. Once we're able to do this and just have that sense of lack of wastages and providing process improvements, you're able to save more and actually cope and care for the future. I can tell you, environment is a major issue. And let's deal with the ones that hurt us the most. Uh, we may not be able to uh, get into what type of power the generation sources. Let's get the power source done. But the ones that live with us, that people are complaining about, that we can deal with, and over time, we can solve the problems uh, on a sustainable uh, basis. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, both of you gentlemen, uh, candidates of the APC, I'd like to get your intervention on the issue of the environment. The challenge... Okay. Uh, Prof, we'll, de we'll get... Okay, all right. Sorry about that. Let me come to you then. It's fair. Fair enough. On the issue of um, environment, climate change, like uh, doctor said, COP26 comes up very, very soon. The climate uh, issues are very, very uh, critical. Uh, of course, Africa is at the receiving end of the impact or the negative impact of climate change. Bringing it down to Anambra, the ecological challenge, uh, erosion and all of that, what will be your solution? Thank you very much. I, um, to say that, and I'll come to the solution. What I've heard is people throwing up the same problems, but without providing the how to solve it. And, and by how is what we want now to the how is what we must discuss. I am the only one in my manifesto that identified the environment as the number one existential threat for Anambra State. It's so stated in my manifesto, and it is so. And I have a huge, one of the four buckets of how we go ahead is the environment. How to get clean, green, planned cities, markets, and communities. That's what that agenda I have really thought out. You want to believe, if you want to know the magnitude of, you know, we talk about this gully erosion. Gully erosion is one. I was at the same China, and I was at Oko, and I visited several of them about this gully erosion. They are threatening. Homes are falling down and so on and so forth. Far beyond some of the gully erosions, far beyond the financial resources of any state government. Even if you spend the entire state resource to do that, that's a no-brainer. But then there is even one that is not talked about, which is flooding. The entire coastal area, I was at uh, Anambra West the other day, you know what they were asking me? To please help them build more IDP camps in the neighboring local government. So that, because six months a year when it rains, it overflows and people are sacked from their homes. And we have a plan, described in my manifesto, of working with the coastal states there and the federal government to begin to build the embankation even if we do one kilometer a year to stop these people from being sacked from their car. In terms of the gully flooding, we have a plan for the master planning of the state. Flooding, flooding is a very key one. Of course, waste disposal is another major issue which will uh, have an agenda to bring back to the local government and the private sector with innovative solutions to deal with. But the flooding part of it, in terms of the coastal, not just on the coastal land, but within the hinterland, we have a three-part solution. What the individuals must do by each individual containing the water outflow from his own compound and not letting it flood into the other city. What the communities must do and what the government has to do. Part of what the government must do is to be able to have a complete planning of all our road networks and systems and to have the final discharge points. What we have currently, of course, we are building a um, whole lot of the roads done for the past two, three decades. We've done them with gutter in between, but we now need the last mile connection to now connect all of this to the final discharge point where all this uh, water that are coming on the road and going on so that they don't start flooding into some places and begin to create some gully erosion, to, so to speak. But let me say this to you. The road to dealing with a climate environmental challenge, one word, partnerships. Partnerships between the individual, the communities, and the state government, and the federal government. Now, the multilateral agencies come also with some technology and financing. 
there is the two parts of international finance available, and I have the well, experience on how to access them. Well, I hope I'll be given five minutes when next year. Well, quickly. Well, the, the timekeeper, the guy on the bell should be, uh, you know, in, a, in any case. Let's come to you quickly, candidate of the uh, All Progressives Congress. What will you do uh, with regard to climate change issues and uh, flooding, uh, gully erosion, and all of that? in Anambra State, yeah, because the, the, as uh, the two other speakers have pointed out, this is a major issue yeah, in Anambra State. Yeah. The erosion in Anambra State is a, is, in, is a catastrophe. What is happening in Anambra State is very terrible. If you look at what is going in near Alex Equimes, former Vice President Alex Equimes has, has almost collapsed because of erosion. Now, somebody that has been advising the government for years that have not been able to address that issue on erosion. They have not asked them what to do, how they do it, but he's telling you what he will do. He didn't advise the government, he's in what the government will do. He didn't advise them. He wants to take out credit for himself and not for the government that he's, he's been advising for years. So we're going to be planting trees too in different places. We we'll plant trees to stop that. We we'll do it in the, in the erosion, uh, the, the gutter erosion. We we'll have to build that system so that the water will not flood. You know, so that's what we need to do. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I, all right. I'm advising the federal government, by the way. They're advising what's federal government. Great. I'm advising, uh, I'm advising no, the federal government. Federal government are you advising? On how to I'm deal with the state. erosion. You, you're advising the state. Okay, you let's, let's go, go on to... You have a senator. What did you do? Uh, I, I know gentlemen, what thank you very much. Let's move on to uh, other issues now that are as important as the ones that we have already uh, treated, and that's um, health. I mean, we've just talked about the environment, climate, and, and all of that. They're, they're all linked to health. And, of course, without health, every other thing that is being discussed here today uh, may just not work. Now, let me start with the bigger picture, where Nigeria actually ranks uh, 14th of 18 countries with the poorest health uh, systems. Uh, and, of course, it, it is no secret that Nigerians spend about $1.6 billion dollars every year on medical tourism because they cannot just get the kind of health care they need. What are your plans? Let me start with you, uh, Valentine Ozibo, the candidate of the PDP. Your plans to ensure access, quality, and efficient health care, especially for the most vulnerable populations of Anambra State, if you become governor. Thank you so very much. Uh, this is such an important uh, question. Uh, for me, health and education, uh, they rank the, the, the most important when it comes to what we need to deal with. And uh, on the health, there's a lot we can do to reverse the tourism, to improve the care, provide better access, increase efficiency within the system, and hold people more accountable. I intend to run a performance-driven governance where people are rewarded when they do right and they are punished when they do wrong. We need everybody to sit up. We need everybody to be held responsible for their actions. And so just bringing that to bear will change the entire psyche within the health care you know, system. And the number of things we need to do, especially at the primary health care, providing better infrastructure, providing people who are well-trained, and ensuring that, indeed, they are held accountable. And then moving to that, to greater partnership we need to deal with, with communities and with the diaspora. What do we need to do to bring those brethren back, those who have gone abroad, learned a lot. We have the best of medical professionals in the U.S. and the U.K. How do we create an environment that will get them back, provide their, those resources back, and build mega system, mega diagnosis centers, so that people can figure out what is wrong with them within a number of states and solve this problem. So there are a number of things we intend to do for both uh, the primary health care, the secondary and tertiary. And the intention here is to provide more access and people can just go get their health um, done with, especially again the vulnerable you've mentioned, the elders and the women who are given birth. When we're able to improve our mortality, I can tell you, uh, we have a healthier environment. But beyond this also, beyond the economic solutions to this, when we have a vibrant economy, we have more prevention than just reacting to diseases. How do we ensure that people take care of themselves 
and including other things they need to do for fitness to ensure that they live a healthier life, eat better food, and take care of themselves and those around them. When you deal with this, we are going to have a better number for everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you very much there. Well, Professor uh, Soludo, what will you do to upgrade the health infrastructure in Anambra State? And, you know, uh, if you were to become uh, governor, you will be uh, a post-COVID-19, if I may use that phrase, uh, governor. And COVID-19 is a major issue of concern globally. In Anambra here, we're told there are about 2,173 cases reported and that uh, only about nine persons uh, uh, reported dead. Uh, but generally, there is a vaccine uh, uh, apathy. There is also a COVID-19 skepticism. Uh, but in all, in all of this, what do you intend to do in the health sector? Thank you very much. Um, one point to make is that I kept saying this. If you can't measure it, you cannot change it. If you don't even know what the data is, if you don't know whether you are cooking for two persons or for 300 persons, you won't be able to execute anything. What I've been hearing here is all, we will fix this, we will do this. Let me, for records, say that about 75% of the healthcare facilities in Anambra is actually private sector driven. It's about 25% that is within the purview of the public sector. So that is for starters. And then for COVID, as you said, Anambra has done very well. If you look at in terms of the 400 and something thousand tests done, uh, the number of confirmed cases, 2,000 plus, and number of deaths, we're about one of the lowest, if not the lowest in the country. And over 92,000 vaccinations so far. The state is doing awfully very well. And I think we have the only state where, uh, I mean, a general hospital is actually administering vaccines. So on COVID-19, our number is doing well. We need to consolidate on that and continue to go on. On the health, generally, two big pronged approach. First is uh, what we call the lifestyle change campaign. Lifestyle change campaign. Change in lifestyle can be everything. My wife has a way of putting it. It says you eat clean, you exercise dirty. And we're going to have that campaign squarely. But on the other bits about fixing the public health infrastructure, obviously we need heavy investment in that sector. We will be working with our private sector. That is where our strength lies. We have thousands of a number of people domiciled in the US and Europe who are medical doctors running big hospitals who want to leverage them. That is where I want to provide leadership. I'm already in talk with several of them who want to build heavy infrastructure. Somebody is actually investing already about $30 million to provide, equipping one of the hospitals to have the best diagnostic center in Nigeria. We're going to leverage on that resource, but then we need something about big data. Okay. We need to scale up our health insurance system that then offers people access to um, health insurance and free treatment or subsidized treatment. We need to upgrade the infrastructure in our general hospitals and our uh, okay. town uh, clinics and uh, uh, primary health centers and so on and so forth. So I think, yes, big data, insurance, addressing personnel in terms of training and remuneration of the healthcare workers, as it were, without dealing All with right. us, I mean, with this, in terms of these buckets, I think the healthcare system in Anambra will continue to get better. But the private sector angle and the partnership with the state is where we're going to bring quite a huge agenda. Thank you very much to the candidate of uh, the APC, Andy Uba. Uh, well, uh, Prof thinks Anambra has done well as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. I wonder if you agree, and if you become governor, what would be your strategy in pushing back the impact of COVID-19? On the issue of vaccines, would you go the way of vaccine, I mean, you know, mandate? Would you make vaccines compulsory in your fight against uh, COVID-19? And, of course, on the issue of primary health care and all of that, how would you address health care and make it more accessible, efficient, and effective? First of all, uh, we have to, I have to, my government will establish three zones, hostile, three different health zones, hostiles in the state. We will use the existing 
hospitals that are in the three zones and upgrade them with, with, upgrade them with equipment, upgrade them with doctors that will bring in, increase their salaries and make sure that they have the right equipment. We're not going to build new ones. It will be a waste of money. We'll upgrade the ones that we have already in the system, the three senatorial zones. And number two, when it comes to COVID, COVID well, I'm not sure the state has done well too, because they would have used the churches to talk about distribution of, of the uh, of on, on, on the, the vaccine, traditional institutions they could use. They could use all kinds of things, to, but they're not doing that. They're not going through the way of, of uh, trying to treat that COVID. We have a lot of numbers of people that are sick. Even though they're hiding it, they're not putting it to the public to know. A lot of people are suffering from, from this situation. So I will want us to now come together as one, get our brothers that are outside the country that wants to invest in health, bring them to invest in those three senatorial hospitals and make them up to date so that people don't have to go give them health insurance uh, programs, health insurance, insurance that they have so they don't have to pay more money when they come to treat themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, gentlemen, let's take on one more very important subject, which is education. Anambra State is known for its intellectual uh, giant uh, in virtually every field of academic endeavor. But unfortunately today, Anambra State, uh, school enrollment is on the very low side. Uh, there are schools uh, that are not well kept. There are teachers who complain about uh, salaries not being paid. There are persons who have retired, uh, but they've not been replaced. A lot of issues. Now, education. What will you do to improve on school enrollment, the state of the schools, the welfare of teachers, from the primary level to the tertiary level. Let's start with you. Candidate of APGA, Professor Charles Soludo. Thank you very much. Um, again, on data, and I will still challenge you to mention the source of your data because I think your data on unemployment for Anambra is not that of the country is wrong. NBS has a different one. But I come to statistics. First of all, I'm the only one here I happen not just to be a professor of economics, a teacher myself, but I have experience running a school. I run a school now with over about 900 pupils there. And I have scholarships all over. I pay about 25 PTA teachers and funding scholarships and paying for jump. So I know what the system, you've come into my terrain. Anambra State Educational System, talking about numbers again, uh, when you talk about enrollment, it depends on which you are referring to. Ruben, if I may just point out to the statistics. Primary school enrollment. Uh -huh. The primary school enrollment data you probably have, you don't, probably don't have that of the uh, private sector. Anambra's primary and secondary education, about 65, 60%, 65% of the total enrollment, primary and secondary, happen to be private schools, actually. So when you look at the data on the public, uh, public schools, then you totally miss the entire uh, picture. What we have to do for education in Anambra is uh, once understanding the structure and the basic structure of our educational system, the issue of uh, having curricular review, a curricular that is in tune with the 21st century, I have an agenda in my manifesto to have an educational system where our graduates are productive at home and exportable abroad. And to do that, we have got about five, six, seven point agenda, including the issue of curricular review that is in tune with the digital age, the 21st century. We have the issue about regulation and supervision, given this dichotomy that a majority of our pupils and students happen to be in private schools, actually. Actually, you have four categories. You have the public, public. You have the public. You have the private, private. You have the mission, private. And you have the mission, public. Four categories of our educational system. So depends on which one that you are referring to. Our focus will be to make public sector, public arm of these four tiers to become as competitive, if not more competitive, than the other uh, tiers. And therefore, every child in Anambra would then have a choice. 
whether to go to public or to go to private or to go to mission public or mission private, as the case may be. So, is to the, that agenda to bring up all, but we've got to also regulate and regulate in terms of standards, in terms of quality, supervision yeah. across all the board. So, but Charles Saludo will have to uh, stop you there. Your three minutes are up. Let me take it to the candidate of the back. PDP. Yes, uh, hopefully. Uh, Valentine Ozibo. Now, well, there's this menace of Anambra youth who prefer to go into learning a trade or a skill uh, at an early age when they really should be in school. Well, as a matter of fact, numbers, uh, uh, Prof, let me just let you know that the figures that we're putting out here uh, come from premium times and budget. They are helping us fact check and give us the accurate figures. So we will, you know, uh, we just have to put it out there. Uh, okay, uh, back to uh, Valentine Ozibo, please. 90,000 Anambra children are out of school. And that is part of the 13 or so million that are out of school in Nigeria. How would you address the issue of out of school in Anambra State if you become governor? And how will you change the trajectory where youths choose or they prefer, you know, to learn a skill, uh, you know, what we call locally, uh, it may boy. How would you address that, please? Thank you so much. You know, there's a lot to say, and I'm hoping this is when you give me that five minutes that I asked for. <laughs> um, the truth be told, it is easy to be on this podium and honestly speak grammar. When we spoke about health, I wish my dear brother and big brother here could have answered to why a simple hospital project in Ethiopia has not been completed in decades. I also want to say this, when it comes to education, it is important that we understand the importance of this. It is about our future. You know, there are several things we all say here that you start to ask, what have we done to that effect? This government, Abga government, has done nothing to improve education. The funding that used to be provided to secondary schools and all that, the vehicles, the, there's nothing. Just provide adequate funding. We're not even talking about getting to UNESCO standard, standard of 25% of budget. That's not what we're discussing here. So please, let's not attempt to reward impunity. Now, what do we intend to do on the educational side? There are three parts agenda we want to pursue. Affordability, quality, and relevance. And I speak about things I've had experiences on. I sat on the board of Jesuit Memorial College in Port Harcourt for years. And I can tell you that if you go there, you see quality at work. It's about making sure you provide sufficient funding in that regard. It's about making sure you train the teachers, you remunerate the teachers, and you hold them accountable when they do well and when they do poorly. And there has to be sanctioned grades. You go there and you do what I call management by walking around. Visit the schools and see and eat with them and learn with them and see what areas that we need to improve on. It's about partnership we also need to infuse with the private sector. Do you know what we can achieve if we say to people, adopt a school in your villages and communities? That's what I have done. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's my turn to speak. Okay. Go ahead, Thank please. You. So, you know, I wish we have an example of what... Anyway, let me go back to the point. When uh, talking about democratizing this, making sure everybody understands what benefits they stand to get, the, how we celebrate them for what they've done, and giving them access to government, when they know that you will listen to them more because they've done the three, the three areas we want to focus on with partnership, roads, construction, uh, education, and healthcare. That if they do things in this regard, I will respond to them as a governor more than I will respond to any other person because these are the areas of emphasis that when we do this, we are unleashing the power of the private sector to bear in solving these perennial problems we face. So I want to submit, indeed, that if we're able to pursue this stream-pronged approach of solving an affordability problem, a quality problem, and, of course, relevance. On that relevance here, we're talking about ensuring that the curriculum, again, is well, attuned to solve the world the problem PDP. we face on ground. Yes, uh, let's come quickly to you, candidate of the APC, Senator Uba, education in Anambra State. 
What's your strategy? Well, education in Anambra State has collapsed completely. Completely collapsed. Now, let me tell you, uh, my government will give a compulsory free education, basic education in Anambra State. And number two, I want to tell you something. Now, there's a Wayek, they took Wayek, and Anambra person came first in that Wayek for this year. Where does Anambra person live? She lives in Lagos. What did Lagos do to make them that smart? That's what we're going to find out what Lagos did. The last year own was in Port Harcourt. What did Rivers do to make them come first? Oh, but not, nobody from Anambra itself comes first from Anambra. Why? Because the educational system has collapsed. Now, we have to employ the best teachers, pay them very well, we have to make sure things are done right in education. Now, if you look at, like I said, look at outside there, they have over 1,000 buses branded. They can't even use the money to pay the school fees of the children or help them in school. They have building a 10 billion conference center. Why? Why don't you put it in education? They have not been able to do so. Those buses, buses go outside and see the buses that are packed there and see what they're doing. Where are these monies coming from? What are you doing with those buses? Nothing. Rather than put it in the education. So we will make sure we build a system, bring people outside that will help us build a system that other states are doing, like Lagos and Portaco and Rivers. So I uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, candidate of the, the, the PDP, very quickly. Girl child education, very critical. The numbers that are coming in, uh, we're hearing that girls are beginning to drop out of school and not even enrolling in schools. Now, the boys that used to be a source of concern are actually enrolling more than the girls. How do you uh, plan to address that? Um, very, very, very pertinent question, especially for me when I started this journey. You have two minutes. Yes. To to emphasis that. is on not just leveraging, but empowering the women and the youth. Because indeed, when we get it right, where the women are concerned, honestly, you are able to optimize the potential uh, in it in us. So for uh, girl child education, it is about solving those problems, especially when it comes to affordability. Uh, if you provide affirmative uh, actions, uh, making sure uh, we help those who need help, uh, providing bursaries, providing encouragement, and ensuring that ins indeed that they uh, become uh, encouraged and become part and parcel of the first levels of education. That will go a long way. And let me also talk about the, the, the boys, uh, because it's not just about the girls. Uh, we spoke earlier about Eba Boy, and uh, in that regard, what I think we need to do, uh, when we get things right, educational posture like I've uh, atomized, and we still find people dropping to go into uh, trade, there's a lot we can do to encourage education even in that trade. My intention is to help build a better ecosystem so that Iba Boy can get to a level not seen before. And I took time to pen this down in a new book I have just, uh, I'm about to publish. Uh, I have a copy here. This book is about seeing how we can bring the right ecosystem, uh, providing educational uh, support for those who are actually in the Iba Boy, uh, providing support and funding as, uh, as, a, as a partner and getting them enrolled in the, in the tax bracket by government, and also helping the banks, financial institutions, uh, providing level of guarantee when they lend in that system, and also getting the multilateral also support. When you have a new ecosystem on Eba Boy, I can tell you that you're not going to be having a problem even if they drop from there, get in there. They still get into school doing that and evolving as a people, because Eba Boy is something that we have cherished that led us to where we are today, and we need to do enough to sustain it going forward. Okay, thank you. Well, we're beginning to run out of time, but as you begin to wind down and you give your closing remarks, there's a question each uh, for each one of you. you asked on no, I'm child. coming back to you. To I'm, I'm coming to you. Uh, so for Professor Soludo, as you begin to wind down, you were advisor and later CBN governor under President Olusha Gumabasanjo. Some question on girl child before you come to that. Well, you can comment on it, but this is the main question I want to ask you because we're trying to uh, wind down. You can respond to what he said, but I also want no, you no, to take to this along. No, but I'm talking about, I thought you were going around on this girl child education thing. Yes, but just hold on. Let me ask you this. You take it on board okay. with your comments. Mm -hmm. You were advisor and later CBN governor under President Obasanjo, uh, where Senator Andy Uba here was a uh, a very close confidant. Did you have cause to relate with him at that time? Uh, and it didn't matter to you at that time, uh, the point you are now making, that uh, you know, he's uneducated. 
The yes. other points you okay. wanted to make, oh, you oh, could oh, go Thank ahead. you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I didn't know Andy from Adam. Wait, I met Adam, I met uh, Andy Oba in the villa, the person who introduced two of us. Three months after I had joined the government as chief economic advisor was Obie Zekwesele. She's alive. After a morning prayer session, he, he, she then called two of us and said, hey, gentlemen, I hope you guys know yourselves. I said, I didn't know him. He introduced us. And from time to time, he came for this morning prayer. I was part of the 15-member inner caucus of uh, President Obasanjo's uh, morning prayer team. I didn't know him, never met him. He was in the, I mean, how would, I, how would our paths have crossed? From what I know about his background, he was in the U.S. as a master, period. So, I mean, he came in as a domestic servant who was, you know, uh, cleaning his shoes and dressing the beds. Where will our paths cross? So, all of a sudden, what I hear is that every Igbo man, every Igbo person who has done well in government, or if he stays in the villa there and hears that somebody was being, he runs and calls you and says, ah, I am talking to, um, sorry, you can't play that game with me. President Obasanjo is alive. Yes. Because he is alive. If you can forge everything else, you cannot lie against a man who is alive. And the first time I actually got to meet with him, sit down, was when he was running, when I was governor of Central Bank, many, some two, three years he was running for office in uh, 2017. And then I went to his house, I think Obi Okol is here, who sat down where I did an analysis for him on ABBA. Uh, they were saying anybody but Andy. And I, that's where the first time I ever sat down with him. And in any case, whatever that is, is if throwing up my name gives him a CV, I concede that to him. If he had a hand in making me, uh, in recommending to the president, whom I woke up with every morning, Monday to Saturday, right. every day, thank you very much. if he did that, thank you very much, sir. But we are talking about thank you very how much. to move our number forward. Thank you. Prof, thank you very much. But you know, like they say, those who will be the greatest have to be servants first. Yeah. All right, uh, to you, the candidate of the APC. Um, would you, I mean, tell us if you ever used his name to gain access. Uh, I wonder how you'd react to that. And again, you did say that Saludo is a manager and not a leader. And yes. you facilitated his uh, governorship of the CBN. Yes. Uh, help us clarify that. No. Yeah, I said he's a manager and not a leader, like I said, and I mean it. Sorry, project, please. I said he's a manager and not a leader, like I said. And for you to be a leader, you must know what is happening in your environment. And he doesn't know. He's telling me he met me in the villa. How can you meet me? He met, he met me in the villa. I wake up with the president, I sleep with the president. Say I'm a domestic staff for the president. Yes, I'm a domestic that clean the president's shoe. That's what he said. Well, he's alive today, we say. We will tell you, the, the, he comes in to use someone to see what can happen. You call me all the time. You, my brother brought, you brought my, when, when they made you see being what do you do? You came to my house to say thank you. You were abrogated, they are alive. Five Igwes came to say thank you to the president for making Central Bank on. He said, no, you thank this person, not me. The, uh, because he's still alive. How could you be saying what you're saying? So I came from the US without a certificate to come and work for us. You think it's easy? You think it's easy? You think it's easy to do so? That's what happened at the end today. It's to show you who, who, the type of person you are. Silence, please. It's to show, the, it's to show the type of today. person you are. President Obasanjo is please, alive. Yeah. Please, the APC candidate has the floor. Professor yeah, Soludo, allow him. It's to show the, it's to show please, the type of person. APC candidate, please face the camera this way. Now, he says yeah, he, 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 says he sleeps you. and wakes up with Obasanjo. How can he say that? He sleeps and wakes up with the person while I live in the villa. You live in the villa. He doesn't live in the villa. And you're telling me that uh, you, 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 you see your person, you see your person, you It's only when you have, uh, you're allowed to come in, you come in. You say you come every morning. Who started the praying of, uh, in the villa? Who started it? Did you start the prayer? Did you start it with us? You didn't. You came in as an interloper trying to find out how you would be there <laughs> to see how you come close to the president. That your center you. I want to address the issue of the child care, yes. the educational thing. Now, I built a vocational school in my, in my, in my, in my village, the biggest vocational school, handed it, over to the, one, handed it over to the state. They refused to use it to train these children for vocational work. They refused to use it today. It's there, it's there right there, big vocational school. That was refu they refused to use it. So what are they doing? The educational system has collapsed in the state. And he is part of addressing the government here. 
Why can't you advise him well on what to do? Thank you. Well, can, candidate of the PDP now, you have a chance when you give your closing remarks two minutes each. But before then, Valentine Ozibo, do you have the experience to do this job? I have the best of experience for this job. Let me again recount. I am a child of grace who has done exceptionally well in anything, any endeavor. I rose from the grassroots, grew up in the villages, and eventually became the best in everything I've done. Secondary school, university, I made the best result in the department, best result in the faculty, became a total accountant and became a fellow of the Institute, a fellow of the Institute of Credit and Administration of Nigeria, a fellow of the Taxation of Nigeria, and also professional. Became, um, worked in banking for 17 years, became best staff in different uh, banking institutions, became CEO of Transcorp Hotels, where it led, became the best business hotel in Africa, and I was voted the best CEO of the year in the world. In, in Spain and in Greece, I was uh, voted hospitality man of the year by different, uh, in, in different years and eventually became the president of Transcorp Group. What this job requires is not just the youthful experience, but the versatility from power to oil and gas, to agribusiness, to sports, to entertainment, to hospitality, to business development. And these are the things I'm coming to bear with. And even more importantly, I am that person who, if I don't know, I accept that I don't know. And I go to the right people, build a powerful team, and we'll get to know and start doing it. There's never one person who thinks he knows it all. And that's what, what, what we must watch out for. There's no, once you're not humble enough to accept and you bring that arrogance that I know it all, then you're not even fit for this job because you can know it all. It's impossible. I can tell you. No clapping. No clapping, please. Thank you. No clapping, audience. Please, thank you. You have been well behaved so far. Let's do so to the very end of this uh, debate. Uh, Professor Charles Chukuma Soludo, uh, let's have your two minutes closing remarks. And if you can, within that, address maybe one or two things that he said, that would be awesome. But you have two minutes for your closing remarks, gentlemen. Um, thank you very much. I think um, we started very well. And um, that's why the hush push, you know, talks about hospital, at least I am building one. Nobody else is building one. Uh, roads have built 4.5 kilometers. Nobody else have adopted a school. Nobody else has done that. I am the person who is running for this office, my dear people of Anambra State. I offer to you my life. God has blessed me abundantly, traveled around the world, served the world, served the nation, and the grateful nation has rewarded me abundantly, honored me. I now want to, and with an excellent health at this stage of my life, I want to use the remainder of my years, days, only God knows what else is left. I want to use those to serve you people of Anambra. I don't need a penny of Anambra's money for my personal use. God has blessed me abundantly. I would devote every minute of my life, every day of the thing. I say, if I'm sworn in today, I'm running to Oboko the same day to begin the revolution. Give me the opportunity, if you hire me, I want to mobilize the creative energies of the whole of Anambra people, home and abroad in diaspora. This is about leadership. I am the only one who has done it before, who has mobilized the country to achieve those things people thought were impossible. Did the banking consolidation, the world said impossible, we got it done. The Financial Times of London describes Saludo as a great reformer and the world has celebrated, the nation has acknowledged. And I think that is the one that we are coming down to. Now I am coming, please, 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 please. Uh, you've, taken, you've taken one minute of mine. If we can't hear them. Yes, you've taken one minute of mine. I think you're my uh, dear friends, my brothers, I don't need to be, but I want to put myself up. Go through all the hawks, and I am prepared to give it to you. That which I have done by adopting a school and giving over a thousand kids life that they don't have. That which I have done as a teacher, the teachers obviously will be the pride of this place. And I think a new Anambra is on the way and we will get it done. Candidates, quiet in the hall. 
No, I mean, we made this very clear that there should be no applause. Now no the applause, no jeering, no jeering, please. You have been well behaved so far. Congress. Thank you very much. Your we two appreciate minutes it. begins now. If elected as Anambra state governor, I will build a coalition government. I will conduct the Anambra uh, local government election in six months. I don't claim to be a professor. I bring people that will help us to, to, to develop the state. So if I'm given the opportunity, I will know what to do. I've been, I have an experience of 16 years, eight years with the president of Nigeria, Basanjo, eight years in the Senate, in the legislature. So I will be the right person to run this state that knows in and out of what is going on in the country and outside the country. So I thank you, and I pray in the number, go out on the 6th of November and vote APC. And that's APC is the, is the government in the center. This government has not helped us. Nkai Nkai has dead, he's dead. Nkai Nkai is finished. We don't have Nkai. What have they done for us? Nothing. So we join the moving train, the central government to be able to Anambra to be attracted and get things that they need. I thank you and by God's grace, APC will win this, this election. No clapping, please. No clapping. All right, uh, the candidates of the PDP, Valentine Ozibo, you have two minutes uh, to give us your closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just say, in the Anambra, the youths of Anambra, the women of Anambra, the traders, the churches, please, I can tell you what we don't need at this point. We don't need anybody who doesn't understand he's here to serve. Who is going to be God and Lord over us? We don't need anybody who is part of this dysfunctional past, who are part of the problem in solving our problem. We need people who are not retired and tired. We need people who are young, energetic, competent, with the right content of character, who have the capacity, the network, the enablement to doing things that are right. We also need somebody who is coming from the right party. PDP, indeed, is only the Democratic Party among the three. I can tell you that indeed, if you go and conduct a poll across Igbo land and ask which is that party that is dear to their heart, today, it doesn't matter the past where these two gentlemen were holding sway. Today, PDP is that party to watch. I can tell you for free. I can also tell you, you need somebody who has a match through the right process. In this hall, the Raccoon Center, it's historic that I'm back here. This is where um, I actually have you know, my primary undertaking. Uh, this is where, indeed, I can tell you that God did magic and I became a divine mandate, a, a carrier of divine, divine mandate through the process of the march. Others who are here on the podium are either in position of the federal or in position of the state where no primary ha happened. And you also need somebody who has the right promise, right commitment from the Anambra. I've shared my manifesto here and indeed I can tell you, Anambra got Chawapo. If I'm given the opportunity to serve Anambra, I want to take Anambra from where it has been, where Peter B left it, do a bit, and make sure I deal with Anambra in a manner that people come back and say, you have done better than any governor that's ever served. I want to be, make Anambra the best state Anambra Thank has ever seen. Thank you very much. I want to inspire professionals. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, gentlemen. The candidates of the APC and the UBA. Thank you so much. The candidate of Abga, Professor Charles Tukuma Soludo, thank you very much. And the candidate of the PDP, Valentine Ozebo, thank you so much. Uh, all the three of you gentlemen, thank you for conducting yourself in a very, very, very civil manner. Of course, there were occasions where you had to face each other, but it has been a great one. Thank you very much. We would appreciate at this point if you can have that symbolic handshake that goes even beyond the symbolic to show that truly politics is a game of how to make the lives of the people better and not to make enemies. Thank you. Well, that's so beautiful. Thank you very much for staying with us on radio and on television. Okay, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, gentlemen, gentlemen, don't go off the stage yet. Please take your seats. Don't go off the stage yet. You, you, you will still have to pose for photographs.
yes, please, you have to take uh, photos together. Yeah, I'm the superhero. Okay. I will see you for what you say. Yes. Sorry, I don't want this to show up in my picture. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. As you uh, stay there to pose for the photographs. Let's, let's we'll, work with the party that is alive. We, 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 we want to uh, thank all of you, you for are, watching. You are standing thank you very up. much. He actually lobbied to be candidate of Apoga. He was <laughs> really. Look at him. You know, look at you know, him. He was candidate of PDP and Kumbu when I left him. I left him. He got to where I am today. I never won. I'm going to teach you how to win election. No, no, no. You were lobbying me to come. You were lobbying me. You were lobbying me. How can I come to? You were going to be candidate of PDP. There is nobody here. You were begging me to come to APC. Who was begging you? Who was begging you? You were begging me. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. We don't want this pass. <laughs> Live from Oka, produced by Arise Television in conjunction with Enough is Enough. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I am Gozi Alebu. <laughs>